Dusk, May 27th, 2019, Dayton, Ohio. It is the evening of Memorial Day, but forecasters at the National Weather Service office in Wilmington, Ohio are on high alert. There is a tornado-driven enhanced risk that has produced several tornadoes earlier in the day further west, and the system is tracking into their coverage area. Right before 9 p.m. local time, the Wilmington office is monitoring the scans from their WSR 88D Doppler radar, KILN, and notice radar signatures consistent with a tornadic circulation. Throughout the night, the Wilmington office forecasters would be relying on the vital scans from KILN to issue tornado warnings and even a tornado emergency as multiple strong to violent tornadoes rip through the Dayton metro area. Thanks to the forecasters and scans from KILN, there were miraculously zero direct fatalities associated with the tornadoes that struck the heavily populated region. In the 21st century, there are so many tools and technologies that meteorologists use to observe, record, and help predict the weather. The tool that is probably the most iconic in this day and age of weather observation is Doppler radar. In this video, I'll be diving into the history of the use of radar in weather, the science behind the technology, and of course, how it's used here in the United States to monitor weather threats. Let us first dive into the history of radar. Like many other great technological innovations, it began in wartime. During the Second World War, the Allies looked for ways to increase their range of threat detectability, as aircraft had become a much more significant threat since the First World War. Radar was still in its infancy, but it was known that it could be used to detect objects way beyond the range of visual detection methods. The war effort drove significant innovation for radar technologies, allowing airfields and naval vessels to detect enemy aircraft and vessels well before any visual or auditory sign of an approaching threat. While developing this technology, radar scientists and operators noted that, depending on how the radar was tuned, would bring back returns of precipitation. After the war had ended, the United States Air Force began to focus on radar to monitor weather rather than just enemy threats. The commercial airline industry was beginning to boom just after the war, and it was an imperative to monitor weather threats around airports to ensure passenger safety. Thus, dedicated weather radars were born. That begs the question, how exactly does radar even work? Fundamentally, weather radars alternate between emitting and listening modes. When emitting, the radar directionally sends a quick pulse of microwaves out into the atmosphere. These microwaves will reflect off of precipitation particles in the atmosphere, directing some of those microwaves back to the radar site. The radar site starts listening for the returns right after emitting a pulse. When the return comes back, several parameters are recorded by the radar site. This return data is then recorded and processed in order to yield a bunch of parameters that are used in various radar products. The whole radar rotates around, constantly flipping between emitting and listening states to cover a full 360 degrees around the radar site. Not only does the radar rotate around, it also tilts between set elevation angles to scan different heights in the atmosphere. This gives meteorologists a full range of information that can be displayed on a 2D map or even a 3D rendering in order to yield the best short-term forecasts and warnings for the general public. Now that we got the fundamentals of how radars work, Let's dive a little deeper into the United States radar infrastructure and understand how some of these radar products are derived. Right up here behind me is KENX, the radar site that is used by the National Weather Service office in Albany, New York. It is a WSR-88D, or a Weather Surveillance Doppler Radar. Developed in 1988, this is one of 160 radar sites across the United States and other United States territories scanning the skies for weather threats. In 1988, the NEXRAD, or Next Generation Radar Network, was put into service. This network consists of 160 WSR-88Ds strategically located all across the United States, given their effective range is 230 to 460 kilometers, depending on the radar product. Speaking of radar products, the classic radar product that everyone knows is reflectivity. Reflectivity is derived from the intensity of the radar return. The intensity of the return is related to the precipitation rate. 
This is the radar product usually shown on newscasts or on a basic weather app. The most common color scales start at green or blue for low precipitation rate, while reds and purples are heavier precipitation rates. The next most common radar product is velocity. Velocity is a little more complicated than reflectivity. Radars scan across a virtual polar grid, with pulses emanating from the origin. When the wind is blowing across this virtual polar grid, any particular wind vector in the field can be broken up into two components, radial and tangential. The radial component is calculated using the change in frequency between the emitted pulse and the return. Thanks to the Doppler effect, an object in motion will change the frequency of the reflected wave, therefore allowing that radial velocity component to be calculated based on that relation. Looking at this velocity scan, Green shows radial velocities moving towards the radar site, and red away from the radar. But what about the tangential wind component? Unfortunately, weather Doppler radar cannot measure the tangential component. So how is true wind velocity determined if the velocity product only shows the radial component? To get the true wind velocity, you have to take into account the direction of the wind from external observations in order to have enough information to approximate it. With trigonometry, you can use the magnitude of the radial velocity measurement and the angle between that measurement and the true velocity vector to get a close approximation of the true wind velocity. However, there is a shortcoming. At 90 and 270 degrees from the direction of the wind, the radar is unable to get a radial velocity measurement since the true wind velocity is purely in the tangential component to the radar site. So at those angles, the velocity shows as zero knots. Let's get into some of the lesser known radar products, many of which utilize the dual polarization capabilities of the WSR-88Ds. Dual polarization is where the radar emits two orientations of the microwave pulses simultaneously. One is vertical and the other is horizontal. This means that each of those pulses returns different values for the same scan, resulting in more information that can be gathered from storms. Differential reflectivity, for example, relates the reflected horizontal and vertical returns as a ratio. This ratio can help indicate precipitation states and droplet shape. Correlation coefficient is another relation between the horizontal and vertical returns, but in this instance not as a ratio, but a statistical correlation. Let's use an example to best illustrate correlation. In the typical rain shower, rain droplets are roughly the same size and shape. Therefore, they are very correlated, yielding a coefficient near 1, or nearly 100% related. In the case of mixed precipitation, like rain and hail, or rain and snow, there's wild variation between each precipitation particle. In that event, the correlation coefficient is closer to 0, or nearly 0% related. The correlation coefficient is also used to verify tornadoes without a visual on the storm. Tornadoes will loft debris of all shapes and sizes from the ground into the beam of the radar pulse. This results in radar returns showing no uniformity in the horizontal and vertical pulses, giving a correlation coefficient of zero. This correlation coefficient drop is called a tornadic debris signature, abbreviated TDS which allows meteorologists issuing tornado warnings confirmation that a tornado is in progress. Differential phase compares the phase difference between the respective vertical and horizontal pulses, not to be confused with the change in frequency that occurs with the Doppler effect, but rather how much offset occurred between the two pulses from being emitted to return. The derived version of this product is useful for locating areas of extreme precipitation, like intense precipitation cores or even hail shafts. All of these radar products provide crucial information to the National Weather Service forecasters. Even with all these products, there are still limitations when it comes to Doppler radar. Resolution with range is one of the biggest issues. Each radar pulse has a physical dimension at the origin, and each pulse is stepped around the origin at a fixed rate. These features of each scan create a pulse volume, which as the pulse emanates further from the radar site, expands from the original cross-section of the pulse. That means the further from a storm from the radar site, 
the less resolution of the data returned is going to be. Look at these two reflectivity scans of the same storm. The left radar is 55 miles away from the storm, while the right is 150. It's also important to remember that the further away from the storm you are, the higher the beam is slicing through the storm. Even at the lowest elevation tilt of 0.5 degrees, a target 150 miles away is going to be scanned at 18,000 feet versus 4,000 feet at 55 miles away. Though radar coverage is pretty consistent across the active severe weather regions of the United States, notable radar holes include northeastern Texas, central North Carolina, and central Minnesota. These radar holes make it difficult for forecasters to discern storm features given the coarse radar resolution in those areas. Multiple reflections, common with large hail, is radar energy that was originally directed towards the ground that bounces back up off the hail again and registers as a phantom return. These radar signatures are called hail spikes. Anomalous propagation causes radar pulses and returns to warp as the atmosphere is not a smooth gradient of heat and pressure with height. Side lobe contamination occurs when residual radiation from the radar induces radar returns from the storms close to radar sites. Radar antennas, like any other directional antenna, direct most signal energy along a desired direction called a main lobe. However, it is impossible to control the signal's field perfectly, and some of this radiation goes in different directions in the form of side lobes. When a storm with heavy precipitation is near a radar site, sometimes the radiation from a side lobe comes back and registers a return. This return is side lobe contamination. One example of side lobe contamination is a phantom velocity scan that may look like rotation, but are not co-located with a storm's updraft. Even with its limitations, it's safe to say that radar is one of the most powerful tools that forecasters and the National Weather Service have at their disposal. National Weather Service meteorologists extensively trained in order to learn all of the complicated behaviors of radar so they can make the right judgment calls when it comes to warning weather threats. Advancements in radar technology have undoubtedly saved thousands of lives over the course of years as we've been able to perfect our radar forecasting techniques in order to detect severe weather threats. Whether it's an impending tornado or a whiteout snow squall, radar can see what our eyes cannot. For the folks of Dayton, Ohio, they were sure lucky to have the watchful eyes of KILN scanning the night sky overhead on the night of the 2019 Memorial Day tornado outbreak.